Welcome to Biohawk. Today's presentation is to be given by myself, Cliff Hawkins, and uh, Sue Greentree, who's our Managing Director of Biohawk. The emphasis today is on food and drink and its digestion, which is key to controlling a, a very large range of diseases that we're interested in. We will have uh, the formal presentation first, and then Sue will uh, follow that with a discussion on uh, what food is available in the normal supermarket system, which is safe for you to have, and then show you how you can treat food with our products. The uh, evolution of all organisms on this planet of ours over many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, has come to the same conclusion that to protect any organism, it needs to have on its surface a protein which is resistant to digestion. And all organisms, whether it is a single cell or a, an animal or a plant, have selected for their primary defense a, a protein which has a particular amino acid called proline. And so if you look at, say, a, a, a virus, it has on its surface proteins, and those proteins have a, a particular structure. All cells have a similar structure to it, but they have a rich in amino acids called proline, which I'll introduce to you in a moment. But the proteins, the, the cells, I'm sorry, that want to be bad to you, for you, they have amino acids different next to the proline than cells that want to be good for you. There's a difference in the actual whole protein structure, but all of them are rich in this amino acid called proline. And if you think of animals, whether it's an insect or a human or any animal, they have on their surface um, collagen, which is very rich in proline. It's... Um, uh, in a human, for example, or in animals, it's over 30% um, proline. And um, th those proteins are completely non-digestible by any other organism. And if you go to plants, all plants, and I want to emphasize all plants, protect themselves against predators by laying down proline in their proteins within their structure. And so today I want to talk about um, all these different foods. The plants, for example, we'll talk about um, all of these are not wanting you to eat them and so they have a protection in there which tells you, please don't eat me. They have a taste, they put a bitterness into their food, they have a colour which tells you I'm dangerous. They go to extreme lengths to tell you they're not the things that you should be eating because they want to live a happy life. And um, so over the evolution of of mankind, uh, especially uh, going back a long time, the people were very uh, focused on selecting plants that were safe for them. And uh, once they found a plant which was safe for them, they cultivated it. In Australia, for example, when um, the English settled in Australia, they should have uh, spoken to the elders of the Aboriginal people, the first settlers in our country, because they, over many, many decades, many I'm sorry, tens of thousands of years, had worked out what was safe to eat in Australia and they were very healthy people. They were eating the right plants and which were not hurting the health. But when the English came, instead of asking that question of the elders of the people, they uh, gave the people, they gave the Aboriginal people flour and alcohol, two of the worst possible foods that you could have given to uh, um, the Aboriginal people. Now, I'm not saying that vegetables are not good for you. Let me emphasise that. I'm just saying to you that you have to prepare your vegetables carefully to break down the proteins which are within uh, the vegetable. Now, the amino acid I'm talking about is proline. It is unique amongst all the amino acids. Amino acids make up the protein structure. Are, the protein is a chain of amino acids. And proline is unique in that it has a ring, which is a, 
uh, five-membered ring. If you look at this, these five atoms here, there's a nitrogen, it's an amino acid. Now there's the nitrogen of the amine, and it has a carboxylate, that's the acid part up here. And uh, this grouping is at right angles to the, to the five-membered ring. Then it goes off to another carboxyl group, which is from another amino acid, so you have a peptide chain. And so if you have multiple prolines in a protein, the protein is not flexible enough for a normal enzyme to digest that um, uh, protein that it's wanting to do. An enzyme over evolution wanted to have a, a flexible substrate where it can come along and cut it up. And, uh, but when you have a protein um, with large numbers of proline, the enzymes that are available are unable to get inside and cut the bonds in the uh, protein chain. And that's all because of the flexibility. Now, there are some enzymes which are designed to cut up a proline-rich protein, and that's what we went looking for from the various foods available in Australia. And we selected uh, a ginger, a number of ginger rhizomes, and we were able to find enzymes in in those uh, foods that were able and were designed to cut up proteins which were proline rich. Now I've just put here some parts of proteins of foods that you know. I mean everyone concentrates on wheat and gluten in particular and uh, the wheat protein, what's a part of the wheat protein, is, has this proline which is co coloured red and next one is glutamine, another proline, and then a tyrosine, the proline, the glutamine, the proline, the glutamine, proline. Now that selection, which is coloured yellow, highlighted yellow, is a part of the protein which excites your immune system and causes uh, inflammation within your gut. And uh, the uh, enzymes that have, are in our ginger products are designed to, to just cut that where those yellow highlights are. If you look at barley, it's not much different. Um, milk has um, an, a number of proteins which are proline rich. Unfortunately, wine, which I love so much, uh, has got similar proteins as the, these other products. By the time you get to carrot and to tomato and things like capsicum, beetroot and asparagus, the, there's so many of these um, prolines and the, the, you can't digest a carrot. I mean, if you eat a carrot, you'll look in your feces, you'll see the carrot is there because you can't possibly digest that if it hasn't been prepared correctly. And so what our aim is, is to break down these proteins so you get the full digestion of the protein, releasing all the nutrition and removing the parts of a protein which can cause an inflammation of your body. Sadly, things like chocolate, um, coffee, which everyone loves, they've got proteins which make them bitter and they, uh, they restrict the nutrition you can get from them. They, um, you just need to, to break down these proteins to release all the flavour of the coffee and the flavour of the chocolate and that is what we do. Now, this uh, slide shows you uh, in the grey, I mean, it's all white, by the way, but I've just coloured it grey. The grey parts are where the nutrients are stored. All the nutrients are stored within little areas which are surrounded by the gluten proteins. The gluten proteins here are coloured green, but they're, they're white, they're not green, but I've coloured them green so you can see it. And they completely encapsulate the nutrition. And when you swallow, uh, say, barley or wheat, and then the digestive system in your stomach, in your small intestine, can't break down the gluten proteins, and so the whole nutrition is not absorbed within those globules that you see, and they go through into your large intestine, where they're uh, fermented by the bacteria that are there, and um, creating acid, which makes your microbiome bad for you, but um, you're not getting the nutrition from these foods unless you break down the gluten before you eat the product. And so that's what we do. We do it 
Um, in the laboratory, we do it in your homes by telling you what, how to prepare food. And of course, commercially, people can use our products to, to make a, a food which is safe for you to eat where all the nutrition is available. Now, um, why do plant-based foods, and I'm focusing initially on plants, plant-based foods uh, and drinks cause food intolerance? Firstly, you have to have a gene, which means that your particular ancestral gene reacts with the peptides that have proline and the amino acid next to it, which is hydrophilic, it loves water. And if you have such a gene, and in Brisbane, where we live, there are about between 70 and 85 percent of people uh, have this gene, and the gene is called HLA-DQ2, or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 or 8 or 9. There's a whole range of them, and there's some others related to it. And in Queensland, by the time we get to North Queensland, the genetics of the people, the ethnicity of the people is such that you would probably have about 85 to 90 percent of the people have this gene. So you have to have this gene which allows the polymerase proteins to interact with the gene and cause the immune system to become sensitized. So you have to have that if you're going to have food intolerance. And then you have to have the gene switched on. When you're born, you come into this world, hopefully you come into this world with your own gene, um, immunity gene switched off. And you rely on your mother's gene coming from her milk. But if you come into the world with the, your, your immune gene switched on, you, you will, the baby instantly recognises that the only food available, which is the mother's milk, is not safe for it, and so it doesn't want to latch on to the mother's breast. So it's, uh, the, the baby is designed, I mean, the link between the baby and the mother is designed on the baby coming into this world without its immunity gene switched on. And it can be switched on in utero if the mother is stressed or perhaps has a vaccination or something happens and the, baby's, the baby comes into the world with its immunity gene switched on and that creates a major problem because in the beginning of its life it needs the mother's milk to create the whole structure of its body for the rest of its life. It's, if you don't get it that right, you'll never, you'll never build into some big strong person. You'll have shoulders that are not um, ready to play front row in a rugby team. It's, um, it is just setting your image for the rest of your life as the mother's milk. And so it's important to get the baby to latch onto the breast and uh, specialists taught us early on in our, in our company's history to put our ginger product under the baby's tongue and the baby immediately will work out a safe and it will latch onto the breast and consume the mother's milk. So the gene can be switched on in utero. Uh, when it's born, uh, we have a vaccination program which will switch it on, or the first infection will switch it on. Um, some people go through life uh, in the history when before vaccinations were common, they, they live many years without having the gene switched on, and then stress would switch it on. And stress really impacts on the sensitivity of your immune system throughout your life. And that stress includes extreme exercise. I mean, triathletes who really, really stress their bodies with their training and with their participation in their sport, that, that stress coming from that will really excite the immune system and enhance the reaction between your immune system and the food you eat. Uh, in Australia, vaccinations prior to 1993 weren't all that successful. Uh, and... Um, so you'll see a difference if you have children being born spanning 1993. The vaccinations after 1993 were very successful and that will impact on the structure of the child, the health of the child, and you'll see a big difference between the children before and after 1993. If you were wise enough to select the food you eat based on your analysis of whether the food is safe or not, or you relied on the, the elders of your the tribe, for example, and the ancient peoples, those peoples uh, spent a lot of time, thousands of years, working out what was safe and what was not safe to eat, and they, they made sure they only ate safe food. But after the last ice age, when 
different plants became available like wheat and uh, they were found to be easy to cultivate and and you could feed them to animals and um, sell your animals so the economics of the food changed dramatically and people uh, then didn't really worry about whether it was safe to have they, they were more interested in how easy it was to get the food and that's the case today we're, we're happy to go to the supermarket and buy whatever is there rather than working out what should I be eating we need to go back and ask the elders of our original peoples what food should we be eating and, and focus on that. Or we use our the science that we've developed to break down the proteins in the food to make them uh, um, safe for us to eat. The hassle is that the immune system should be about here. It should be switched on so we're protected against viruses and bacteria and the immune system is putting out proteins to switch on cells like B cells to give you immunoglobulins which help protect you and if, if you're in this sort of position all is well but if we uh, have this gene and we eat the western food or I call western food and the western food has these proteins which are probably enriched with hydrophilic amino acids next to the proline every time we have some of them the immune system is sensitized and so we have it for breakfast, we have it for morning tea, we have it for lunch. The body is set up to try and bring it back down. But because we regularly eat these foods, we have afternoon tea, we have dinner, we have a wine with our dinner, we might have a snack. And so it sits up here somewhere, it can't come down to where it should be. Our immune system has been hypersensitized. And at this level, it's putting out immune proteins at such high concentrations, it can turn on a whole range of genes within your body good genes and bad genes and so if you have an autoimmune gene which is a, a cause of a major disease problem it can be switched on when your immune system is up here of course the immune proteins were supposed to be helping you can also hurt you by switching on genes such as diabetes or something like that now there is a sort of a level where you switch on a large range of autoimmune conditions and there's another level much higher which can switch on really, really bad autoimmune conditions, and that comes about through getting infections. If you get a bad infection in your brain, for example, of a virus which comes from, say, an insect, as I'll talk about in a moment, then the, these viruses uh, uh, live uh, in a state for a long time in your brain, and they stir up your immune system, and the Im immune system is up here, not down here, or not down here, so it's up here, and when it's up here, the, the proteins that are expressed, immune proteins are so at high level they can switch on really bad autoimmune conditions like Parkinson's disease or multiple myeloma or multiple cirrhosis or motor neuron disease or, or, or autism or a whole range of things. So you've got uh, levels which are very high and it's very important to remove those uh, insects so that the immune system comes in. Now, there's many autoimmune genes. I mean, you've got a choice, I say over 200, but it's probably way over 300. And the other problem is that the immunoglobulins, the Ig, immuno, the immunoglobulin gamma, uh, which is expressed by the B cells to help you, if you have a large concentrations of them, those uh, immunoglobulins go looking for problem rich proteins. And if your gut is not lined with, uh, say, fat, and it's exposed, then the gut is lined with um, collagen, which is a polymer rich protein, and the IgG will bind to your gut. And then you'll have cells come along to try and remove that immunocomplex between the IgG and the polymer rich protein, and so it eats a bit of your gut. So a white cell comes along and eats a bit of your gut, and you have now a trauma in your gut, and uh, that. Uh, then can get bacteria living in it and cause more inflammation of your gut. So it's important to understand that your gut has to be lined. And the move towards uh, skinny milk was a move in the wrong direction. You will need, you need the fat from animal milk to coat the gut. And that uh, fat protects it against the IgG attacking the gut lining. The, the immunoglobulin G can also be pumped up quickly into the brain 
And when it's into the brain, if you have a high concentration of it, it can go up into the brain and there it can bind to, say, your white matter, uh, which is pollen rich, and um, cause, and the, and the macrophages in the brain can then cause the same sort of damage to your white matter as it can to your gut. And so it's important to limit the concentration of IgG. So it's not able to go up in large concentration. For example, in your brain, it can cross the blood brain barrier and cause you a problem in your brain. And of course, if you have a, infections in your brain, those, those infections can cause the IgG populations going up and you need to control those. So we looked at plant-based products. I'm not saying don't eat vegetables. I'm saying, or, or fruit, I'm saying, by all means, it's very healthy to eat those things. But you have to prepare that food correctly to break down those proteins so you can digest the food. Because if you're not digesting the food before it goes past the small intestine, it's causing a problem in your large intestine. So it's important before you put any food in your mouth that the food has been digested so that the proteins, partially digested, so the bad proteins have been broken down and so the food is safe for you and that your digestive system can now handle them as it was designed to do. If we look at meat, uh, meat, um, uh, it does, people think meat causes food intolerance, it doesn't. The meat proteins do not cause food intolerance, but the meat could have in it um, fat, and in that fat you can have proteins from the grasses or cereals that the animal's been eating, and they have to be broken down before you eat the meat. And so we, re we recommend people condition their meat with uh, our ginger enzymes, which are designed to break down these plant-based proteins in the fat. Meat has collagen, and collagen as a connective tissue holding together meat muscles. The muscles are safe for you to eat. The collagen is safe for you to eat, but it makes the meat tough. And so that limits the digestibility of the meat, and you're not getting the full nutrition out of the meat. And the, thankfully, the... The ginger enzymes are designed to break down the collagen between 50 and 67 degrees. Up to 50 degrees, the uh, collagen molecule is uh, resistant to being broken down. Now, the humans uh, are designed to eat meat. They're a facultative carnivore, so when you start chewing the meat, the digestive system expresses uh, enzymes and, and acid to commence the digestion. And um, the plant-based, the, the plant feed proteins are the problem in meat in that they can get into the fat. So it's important to remove excess fat from your meat before you start uh, cooking it. Now the collagen is an interesting molecule. Uh, it's, a, it's a long protein and it's helical and it has three of these helices joined together. So you've got a triple helix. And that triple helix has the prolines on the outside, like a cylinder. And in the inside, it has an amino acid called glycine, which is hydrophobic, it's not hydrophilic. And so uh, it will not stir up your, your immune system, but because it has this structure, your digestive system can't possibly digest uh, the collagen. And, um, at 50 degrees, the triple helix breaks down to single proteins, and since it's now more open structure, the ginger enzymes can go in and cut the collagen at the few sites where you have a proline next to a hydrophilic amino acid. So the ginger enzymes above 50, when the triple helix breaks down, can digest the connective tissue and tenderize your meat. And, uh, the enzyme in the ginger turns off at 67 degrees, so you've got a window between 50 degrees and 67 degrees where you can, you can break down the collagen and tenderise meat and improve the digestibility of the meat. Thankfully, a whole range of people have done studies on the Biohawk ginger products in terms of their tender, the ability to tenderise meat, and it's recognised internationally as, the, as the, the, really the only natural meat tenderised that tenderises the meat correctly to make best benefits of the meat 
proteins and other nutrients. Now, I want to talk about milk. I mean, everyone thinks of gluten and milk as the major problems. Uh, they are a problem, but they're not the only problems. Um, and of course, human milk and cow milk, goat milk, sheep milk, camel milk, all cause food intolerance. And they do that because they, they, uh, they have these proline peptides within their structure and causing it to be non-digestible and which stimulate your immune system. So it's, um, it's important to understand that milks will uh, cause you food intolerance and you have to treat the food before you drink the food to make sure it's safe. And that's what we do. As I mentioned before, the baby will not latch on to the breast unless um, it feels it's safe to do that. And if the immune system is switched on, you have to put the, the ginger enzyme under the baby's tongue and all will be well. Um, everyone talks about A2 milk these days. It's, it's been brought in and focused on because it has a structure where it has one more proline, which makes it less digestible but it allows the um, a peptide not to be released so easily and that peptide goes up to your brain and causes a range of inflammations in your brain so if you look at the part of the protein this is beta casein in milk and there's a, a group here which is the peptide they're talking about which can go up to your brain and cause a problem and in the a2 milk it has a proline next to it and so it's more difficult to break down this part of the protein in your gut and so they say A2 milk's better for you whereas A1 milk has instead of a proline has a histidine so it's more easy to break down the A1 milk but with our ginger enzyme in the milk we break down both A2 and A1 and all, all the night nutrition can be gained safely from milk becomes a safe product without worrying about it. Now people have been focusing more and more on plant extracts uh, they call them milk, but I can't see how you can call them milk. And, and they think that that must be safe because um, you know, cow's milk is dangerous, they think. Whereas plant-based foods must be safe, but they're not because the plants have been designed to, um, to stop you eating them. And so, like soy milk, for example, um, that causes major problems to the immune system and that doesn't have the right fats in there to coat your gut and there's a whole range of problems so you can break down the proteins in them but I think if you wanted to drink a milk the um, cow, goat, sheep or camel or human milk is far superior than, than these other milks the blue um, peptide uh, that V are valine and arginine. Uh, that is uh, the point where the bio um, pineapple product will break down the uh, casein product. Where the yellow is, the ginger will break down the protein. Now eggs, people say eggs are a problem. They are. They'll cause food intolerance. The proteins uh, are complicated because some of the amino acids have been changed by having things like um, phosphoric acid bound to them, like this serine in the, the dominant um, protein in egg white. It's got serine with the phosphoric acid, two of them, and it has an asparagine, which has a large carbohydrate bound to it, which coats it and makes it more difficult for enzymes to break down the protein. But the ginger enzyme is able to come down and break the where you see the proline with the yellow highlight. The ginger enzyme can break down the egg white protein very quickly. And you have to understand that, that the egg white will be broken down. You'll see it as soon as you put a, a drop of the ginger oil onto an egg. When you break the egg and put ginger, a couple of drops of ginger oil onto it, that's our ginger oil, which is our enzymes into, let's say, rice bran oil you'll see the egg white just disintegrate in a sense. Now, that doesn't cause a problem if you want a poached egg. It's easy to do to make a beautiful poached egg. It tastes much nicer and it's now safe for you to have. And the 
ginger en uh, enzymes will break down the polymerase proteins in uh, egg white and egg yolk, making it safe for you to eat. Now, a major problem, especially in a country like Australia, where we seem to have every insect known to man, and in Queensland, in the tropical state, we have a large range of biting insects, which all like to inject you know, viruses and some bacteria into you, into your blood to help them get what they want out of your blood. And these um, organisms go up through your blood, through the blood brain barrier into your brain. And this causes major hassles for the health of people um, and causes a problem for food intolerance because the immune system gets so stirred up by that that it just makes the effect of the food much greater on people who have um, who have infections coming from insect bites. And so the, the insects, there are many of them, um, like spiders, for example, or midges, or um, mosquitoes, or... I haven't got down there, but what we call a march fly or a horse fly or a stable fly, it's the same thing. It, it injects a very large number of um, organisms into your blood. Or ticks is another one. So we have all these biting insects and they all like to inject bacteria or viruses into your blood. And this causes a problem. And you have to get rid of that infection if you want to become well. Thankfully, our combination of our pineapple uh, enzymes and our ginger enzyme can get rid of these infections, even out of your brain. The problem is in all these infections, there's a carbohydrate coating over the membrane. The, the organism has polymerase proteins to protect itself on the surface, but they, these ones have mutated to also put a carbohydrate coating on them. And once they put a carbohydrate coating on them, they're able to travel through your body and up into your brain. And once they're in the brain, they can live there for a long time in white cells. And every time you get stressed, they will re-emerge and cause an infection and cause your immune sensitivity to go crazy. So you have to remove those uh, infections from your brain and through, from your body. And what we do is use uh, an enzyme from our pineapple, Queensland pineapple. It has an enzyme, not only the bromelain, which is a protease, it breaks down the protein. It has an enzyme which removes carbohydrate from the protein. So our particular pineapple that we choose to use uh, removes the carbohydrate. If you don't remove that carbohydrate, um, the various anti you know the various medicinals to break down the attack virus or attack bacteria can't work. You have to take off the carbohydrate and expose the proteins, and then it becomes even difficult for medicinals to do it. But we just cut off the primary rich proteins, and we have a naked virus and bacterium that can't function and hurt you. So our aim is to give a haircut to any bad organism by taking off the carbohydrate with our pineapple enzymes and then taking out off the polymerase proteins with our ginger enzymes. How do you know you have food intolerance? Well, that's um, it's a it's an interesting question. Actually, everyone takes it as just normal life. They they have um, they have wind in their gut. They have reflux. Sadly, my, my mother, she's, uh, she was a little Irish girl and um, she had bad food intolerance and she had bad reflux. And late in her life, she um, died from having the, a ball artery in a esophagus eaten away by the reflux acid. And she bled to death and um, I, I wasn't near her at the time. And I, I, I asked, how did my mother die? And they all said, oh, she bled to death. But I, I was then staggered to find out it was because her uh, this artery had been eaten away by reflux. And uh, it was before I started work on food intolerance. But it really brought home the message how it's important it is, is to control things like wind and reflux in the body. It's not just life, it is something you can remove. And you get a pain in your gut and damage to your gut, um, which is, makes your life not a happy one. You can get diarrhea or constipation. It's not normal to have diarrhea and constipation. You have to do something about it. You get tired, and chronic tiredness, chronic fatigue, and you get a fuzzy head because you've got these proteins and peptides going up through the blood into your brain and interacting with the various receptors in your brain. So if, you're, if you've got food intolerance and you're not doing anything about it, you'll have a fuzzy head 
and you'll be tired. And it's, chronic fatigue is just really a bad thing to have. And you can easily remove it within three to five weeks. You can completely remove all those sort of problems if you follow our protocol. People often recognise eczema and uh, other allergies. Allergies uh, are an IgE, not an IgG mediated response. The epsilon immunoglobulin epsilon, and uh, these allergies again are coming from the food intolerance. It's the same proteins on on plant in you know, a plant allergy. The proteins on a plant allergy are the same as the proteins on a food allergy, and you just break you can break it down these allergic protein reactions using our ginger enzymes. The one I look at myself when people want to talk to me about their food intolerance. I look at their body shape because the body shape will tell you if they've got food intolerance or not. If a woman has food intolerance when she eats uh, a food, uh, the, the body will try to protect her against uh, the effects of the food intolerance and it lay, lays down a white fat. Another woman lays it down on her thighs first and then on her backside and maybe on her breast. And, um, and you can just look at women walking you know, down the street in front of you and you can see this fat on their thigh and they can exercise all they like, they won't go, or on their bottom. And, um, it, and some women have it on their uh, stomachs. Well, men lay down white fat on their tummies when they get try to protect themselves against white fat. And so if a woman lays down fat on the, on the stomach, it's because she is um, wanting to be more dominant in her work. She needs to be dominant or because she wants to boss her husband around, she get, becomes dom dominant and by being dominant, her testosterone levels go up and she lays down fat on her tummy. So it's a sign of not obesity. There, of course, if you eat too much food or the wrong food, you can become obese. But this particular white fat is not a sign of obesity. It's a sign of food intolerance. And... Um, I just, I'm, I'm concerned by all these studies where they, they look at, uh, they, they have a chart of people and are they obese? And the, all these people with food intolerance, they classify as obese because they've got fat on their thighs and backside and tummies. And then they say, do they have diabetes? Do they have cancer? Do they have this? Do they have that disease? And then they blame it all on the obesity. They say, oh, obesity causes cancer and diabetes and everything else. No, that's not the case. The problem is that if you have food intolerance, you, you have these autoimmune conditions, one of which is laying down white fat on your parts of your body. Now we have a solution, it's a two-step solution. And um, the first step, which is crucial for all people, whether you have food intolerance or not, you want to get your microbiome in your large intestine correct. Because if you don't have it correct, if you don't have the pH of your hindgut, above 6.2, then you will have no good bacteria dominating the microbiome. You'll have only bad bacteria dominating the microbiome. You want to have a healthy microbiome because it puts out all sorts of goodies into your, into your, uh, into your system to help in nutrition and the metabolism of all the nutrients you have. And um, if you have only bad bacteria in your large intestine, as most of you do, if you're not uh, following what I'm saying to you, if you're not using our ginger enzymes in the preparation of your food, you'll have bad bacteria which are putting in toxins, putting out toxins which will harm you, and putting out uh, the wrong fatty acids, and interfering with your complete metabolism. And it will have major impacts on, on things like your tendons, your bone structure. If you're a horse, you get laminitis. I mean, it's very important to understand that you have to have a healthy microbiome. The only way you can do that is not by having probiotics. Probiotics, you can put all the good bacteria you like into you, but they can't survive if the pH of your large intestine is above 6.2. And if you're not following what I'm saying, of breaking down these primary rich proteins before they pass through your large, small intestine, then you'll have, a, you'll have a pH of your large intestine less than 6.2. And below 6.2, the bad bacteria dominate. Once you break down, you know, you follow this regime, you will notice a major change in the microbiome. Um, we look to see how we can change that pH in animals. And in a racehorse, for example, it takes three days by just adding our ginger enzyme into the feed 
within three days the microbiome becomes a healthy one. So it's important to understand that. You have to, and whether, whether you have food intolerance or not, you want to break down these proteins in your food before you eat them. The other thing is that if you follow this regime I'm talking about, by breaking down the protein rich proteins, you're releasing all the nutrients. Before it leaves the small intestine, all the nutrients have become available and being absorbed. And so you will realise yourself that you can cut back the food you're eating by 40%. Now, it's something I observed first in, in animals. In animals, like a racehorse, for example, if you put our ginger enzymes uh, food into uh, their feed, after three days on this uh, ingredient in, in their feed, they cut back the food about 50%. And it's, um, the, the trainers get worried. They're not getting enough energy. And I always say to them, yes, they are. The horse is telling you, you're wasting your money. Why do you want to give them all that feed when they don't need it? The horse will eat what it needs. And I, I notice in chickens, they're a bit smarter. They do it a bit faster. Cattle are about somewhere between the three and seven days. They'll work out, they can cut back their feed. And um, a woman, uh, and we're the intelligent uh, species, a woman works it out in about three weeks and she starts to cut back the feed that she has and hopefully cuts back the feed her husband has. Because if you left it to the man, and I'm a man so I can say this, um, men never work that out that they can cut back their feed. Uh, but you have to cut back your feed, in a sense, because now you're getting all the nutrition and um, you, won't, you won't put on fat, obesity fat. You'll put on muscle. That's like our chickens do and our pigs do and our cattle do and sheep do. They all put on beautiful muscle and uh, because then they're getting all the nutrition. So you have to cut back your food and you save a lot of money. Why do you want to spend all that money on your food when you can cut it back because you're getting all the nutrition out of the food? It's much more sustainable for you to do that. The important point is that by breaking down the food proteins before you eat, and the drinks as well, your wine, your coffee, your tea, your whiskey, your gin, your beer, all these things, your milk, your juice. By breaking down these proteins before you eat it, you, you stop the food intolerance and you get your immune system calm and where it's just helping you defend yourself against in, in infections. So you want to have your immune system level where you've switched off all the genes for autoimmune conditions. Now, the second solution is to uh, take the bio uh, ginger product or the uh, pine crush. And uh, we recommend that you take the, the ginger product, either the relief, which is a powder, ginger powder. It's a full ginger powder. It's three gingers. It's the culinary ginger. It's uh, gal and gal, Alpinia gal and galanga and turmeric. Uh, there's the whole rhizome, which is... Um, broken down in small pieces and dried and milled into a powder and you get the lot. You get you get the ginger oils which are very useful. There's a large number of ginger oils which have been tested in formal clinical trials to show that they are, are good for a whole range of uh, health conditions. You get those, you get fibre, you get um, carbohydrate, you get minerals, you get the enzymes and you get the lot. Every bit of the rhizome you get and so you, we have them, we recommend you take that or the Digest Easy. The Digest Easy is designed uh, for people who can't um, uh, tolerate the spiciness of the ginger powder. And we remove uh, the, the, the solids out of the product. We get rid of the fibre which has most of the oils attached to it and the st most of the starch. And so you, the Digest Easy has is, is got a little spiciness to it but not much and safe to give to a day old baby or a child or a man who's a very sensitive creature and um, so you have those after the meal to help them the digestion of the food that you've had you don't have to have it immediately after the meal you can have it over any time to ensure the pollen which proteins are broken down and the peptides are fully digested and the next thing they have to do is activate macrophages we worked out in our laboratory that if you use our ginger enzymes, they'll give a haircut to a macrophage, which is the body's defense mechanism. The body will repair your body 
the body will have repair damage to your body, whether it comes from, say, a cut or from a, a, a you've been burnt or something like this. It will repair that damage, and it uses a cell which sets to work and repairs it. But unfortunately, the the actual macrophage is uh, it goes to the site of the damage which needs to be repaired, but it doesn't seem to understand it has to work. And so we give it a prod along by giving it a haircut. We just cut off one of the proteins on the surface and immediately it, uh, start, it gets to work and heals any cut or burn. And it's rapid. It's a rapid healing process. So it's an important part of having the ginger enzyme. And um, then it, it gives a haircut to, to infections. And it does that by, by cutting off from the membrane of the all infections have a polymerase protein on the surface. All infections that are bad for you have the polymerase protein where you have a hydrophilic amino acid next to the protein. And so the ginger will give a haircut to all these particular proteins. And then we use pine crush as a way of taking the, the carbohydrate off the surface of the infection. And you, we, we recommend people take that about 20, at least 20 minutes before the ginger, uh, or we have it before the meal, the ginger after the meal. But it helps in the, in the breaking down of the surface proteins on infection, infectious organisms. And biox, pine crush and ginger enzymes are able to cross the blood-brain barrier because they have carbohydrate parts themselves, and they're able to inhibit infectious organisms in the brain. Thank you. Thank you very much.